Say again, brother. Uh, before we get started, my man Danny Boy from House of Pain wanted to send you a bet. What? Danny? That little short guy that's only six foot five? <laughs> I love him, man. Damn. Damn, I ain't seen him. No, I ain't seen him since uh, Lincoln was the president, I think. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, he uh, reached out and told me to tell you hello. Tell when you speak to him, tell him I ain't got nothing but love for him. Absolutely. Because them boys were off the chain, man. You know how different groups come out fronting. I'm I'm a gangster, I'm this and that. No, they came out live and direct what they were and they played it. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh snap. Jump, jump, jump around. Absolutely. Yo, I saw some of your collection. That stuff is dope, man. I appreciate that. You, where you at? Where you live? Indiana. Okay, if you're out in New York, man, I could show you things that are, you know, because I've been, man, come on. 40, 40 plus years, huh? Yeah, I got Tim Dog's uh, F. Compton hat. I have Easy E's Compton hat. <laughs> Damn. Man, wow. man, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man. Oh next, man. Next time I'm in I'm in New York, I'm definitely reaching out. Yeah, baby. You know, it's like wow, wow, Danny boy. Yeah. We didn't realize I think that was nineteen ninety two and somebody came out and housed everybody. They had all these gangster rappers and tough guys and killers and drug dealers. And these little boys came out crisscross and housed everybody. <laughs> totally. Came out of nowhere. Yeah. And, and Everlast, House was Everlast was around for a while, but when they came out as House of Pain, I mean, they were undeniable. They were dope, man. There were a lot of things happening in 92. Naughty by Nature came out. Uh, Cypress Hill was 91. Cy Cypress Hill. Uh, it, it's so beautiful, man, because, like, all these cats just came. And Ghetto Boys just, I was at their first show in New York, and they got women were throwing bottles at them because they were talking about serial killers and all kinds of heavy stuff. And then when they came out with that... Uh, mind's playing tricks? Yeah, my mind's playing tricks on me. And I'm so mad at those cats because I've still been at, I've still been trying to figure out what that sample is. It's dope as hell. And I said, we ain't going to tell you because then we got to pay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, you know, I'm not a snitch. I ain't going to tell nobody Absolutely. You know, what the sample was, but I was just curious because that sample was doper than... Oh, man. Thank you for having me on your show, my brother. Everybody logging on right now, this is History Lesson, episode 68, with the legendary hip-hop photographer, Ernie Panicoli, a.k.a. the Big Red Alarm Clock. Oh, you did your homework. Damn, G. Yes, sir. Damn, G. Damn, G. <laughs> Damn, G. Wow. Kid and Play also came out in that time. Oh, snap. Chris, Chris Cross. Yes, undeniable. See, I just talk about it and it happens. It's just funny. That's the first book I pulled out. Here's some cat who uh, was real quiet and, and he was real religious. And real, real quiet. And uh, he was really a nice guy. I, I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> oh, that guy. <laughs> he was always talking about love and peace. Nah. Not hey, hey. Uh, Kwame. Yeah, but look at Ice Cube. Oh, man. Ice Cube was down with the lynch mark. Oh, my like, oh, snap. Oh, man. Here's, here's the God, Rakim. To me, that's the highest. Man, don't get no better. Him and Karras, one, Chuck D, there's just certain brothers. And look, this is crazy. There's uh, Pete Rock and Jay-Z, and they're both wearing the same Jesus piece. Crazy. Oh, man. Jigger. Jigger, <laughs> jigger. Jigger, jigger. 
man, you don't even know what I'm looking at here. And here's the brother. I photographed this three days before his transition. Oh, wow. Big pun. Rest in peace. Crazy. Oh, big yeah. Big pun. Get you with the big gun. Oh, snap. <laughs> Ooh, crazy. Pun and Nori. Man, there was just so much going on. Here's one of my heroes. And most of my heroes don't appear on those stamps. Grand Wizard Theodore, who invented the scratch. Grand Wizard Theodore. What year was that from? That was probably 2004. Okay. And here's a brother that's visually incredible and what he did, he's in the he's in the Forever Hall of Fame. Uh, Scorpio from Melly Mel and Scorpio. Grandmaster Flash. No. No. Scorpio. Ah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Scorpio. And here, here's, here's a cat that set it on fire. He got tired of hearing about, I'm from Compton. He's like, Tim Dog. <laughs> I'm not going to do it, but. Ah, man, those classic shirts. I got one of them shirts. Still, huh? Still. You want to see Michael Jordan and Dougie Fresh? Yeah. Man, oh, man, oh, man. And I don't call nobody a bastard, especially an old dirty bastard, but I oh. call him an old dirty bastard. How crazy is that photo? And Raekwon knows. Oh, yeah. Ice cream. <laughs> All them flavors in my truck. Yeah. Here's another real gentle, quiet brother. A real, real quiet cat. <laughs> Peace, love, and harmony. No, not really. That's my brother, Ice-T. And there's Michael and Whitney. Oh, Wow. Well, was a lot of pictures of Michael and Whitney and Bobby and Biggie and man, people. Okay, question. Yeah. Who's this? That is Zev Love X, aka MF Doom. No mask. No mask. The good day. Crazy. Dougie Fresh and ODB. Oh wow! What we club? We grabbed the mic from him, and the security came, and Dougie said, no, no, no. We're going to do this right. We're going to do this hip-hop. And they did a duet and blew everybody's mind because it was just organic. Wow. Third base, Daddy Rich. Pete Nice, MC Search, classic. MC Search? Okay, here's a test for you. Who's okay. this white dude? Come on. I uh, know that's DMC. Yes. And that is... Um, Hip-hop royalty. You got me. Keith Harry. Ah. He did the little jiggly babies. Where was that at? That was in New York, man, at some club at 4 o'clock in the morning. And here's one of my favorite groups that people will not be able to understand the lyrics for another 50 years. De La Soul. They lost soul. Wow. It's just me, myself, and I. Tim Dog. Tim Dog. Tim Dog used to roll with a posse of about 50 dudes, man. All looked like they just got out of maximum security. Trying to see over the glare there. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's all right. It looks like meth. And Red Man. Red Man. Okay, whose hands are these? Looks like Baby You. You got it. You got it, damn. Yes, sir. I hear somebody getting some head. <laughs> that looks like Tretch. <laughs> Forgive my humor. Oh, I can't even show you that picture. Yes. So, wrong. Let's get into a little history about yourself before we get into this fantastic book that 
one should have if they don't have it at this time. Uh, take us back to where you're born and raised, Ernie. Brooklyn. As Guru said, Brooklyn, the planet. Someone stinks in here. Yeah. Uh, Brooklyn. And uh, it, it left scars on me, both good and bad. And it left an indelible mark. And, you know, I hear people now uh, saying, uh, you hear Brooklyn and they throw up their hands or go to a club and say, who's from Brooklyn, everybody. But there were a lot of sides of Brooklyn. There was a part of Brooklyn that was so racist you couldn't walk in it. There was a part of Brooklyn uh, that, that uh, in Brighton Beach that it was all Russian, Russian mobsters. So uh, there was, you know, Sheep's Head Bay, which was the Italian section. You had different sections. It was like uh, different states or different city states or different uh, realities. And I came out of that soup, souffle, whatever you want to call it. I came out of that mix. And, uh, oh, man, I, I could tell you stories I'd rather not about how I survived. But in Brooklyn, the number one thing was always survival, man. Just getting from Monday to Tuesday was an art in itself. What were some of the problems or uh, some of the um, early problems you may have had to endure uh, in Brooklyn? Uh, people call me a spick and uh, call me Coach Chiefs and Geronimo, all these racists, what they thought, like the president calling people Pocahontas. You know, and uh, the most dangerous word in Brooklyn, ironically, is not even a curse word. It's the word what? Somebody come up and put a gun in your face and say what? Or pull out a knife and say what? Or two or three of their boys come, what? You know, so a lot of people talk about different dangerous words, but the word what? <laughs> you know, it was like, it, that was do or die. Somebody come up to you and say, what? There was no, there's no answer for that. It's fight or flee. But there was no, there was no rational. Uh, these are just memories of Brooklyn, man. And uh, I don't want to be prejudiced, but I think there's no place like Brooklyn. And I guess everybody feels like that if they're from Compton or wherever, Newark or whatever. But to me, and history bored out just some strange things, man. Uh, there's nothing like Brooklyn, you know, uh, good or bad. It, 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 it's powerful. My man Mo Crazy just logged on, and he says, Ernie the legend, dopest, dopest Native American alive. Did he say dopiest or dopest? Dope. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Dad. Controlled by Hate is my son. That's the lamest title I ever heard. Controlled by Hate. Brother, you were created from love. <laughs> Raised by love. That's my son. Oh, man. Sometimes people say you're dope, and you say, did you say dopey? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can you take us back to your earliest memories of hip hop growing up in Brooklyn that you see firsthand? No, actually, the truth is, I'm 73. So if you do the math, I was already 30 by the time hip hop even started to crawl out of its, you know, out of out of its womb. And uh, I I was on uh, some program the other day, and somebody kept saying 73. Uh, Cool Herc in 74. I mean, you cats are so wrong. It's ridiculous. Hip-hop is older than us. Hip-hop started in Africa. Hip-hop started with the drum. Hip-hop started with the sand paintings and, and the etchings and the hieroglyphics and the pyramids. Hip-hop started with the, the, the griots and the storytellers. Hip-hop started with you know, the B-boy. Nah, we had dancers, man. Anytime anybody had a baby or a good crop or were about to go to war, even indigenous people around the world had dance. So I look at hip-hop as ancient because it's part of 
us forever. You know, you put a label, maybe a hundred years from now, they'll call it booty boo. You know, who knows? But right now they're calling it hip hop, which is okay. But hip hop was in the slave songs. I had a brother from Liverpool uh, send me a tape of somebody called the Beale Street Sheiks. And it was a rap song from, from the 30s or the 20s or somewhere like that, where the guy was talking about his jewelry, his woman, his car. Yeah. So even even rapping ain't new. And you had uh, Here Comes the Judge. So what first hooked me into hip hop was the graffiti. I'm a painter and I love colors. And I walk around, I say, how the hell are these kids got, got no training in colors make incredible black long murals? You know, and I was blown away. And that's why I picked up a camera and saw a document. And, yeah. So can you take us back to what year that was when you uh, found your passion for photography? Probably 71, 72. And uh, the reason I started, forgive me, uh, the reason I started photography was because I had already been deep into painting and drawing. Uh, You're getting a worldwide exclusive here. Yes, sir. So when I picked up a camera, I realized I could do things that take me a long time and I could do it in a 60th of a second. Wow. Beautiful. And painting transferred into photography. There's photographers that transition into painting, but I had it backwards. So, and I always put science and mathematics in my work. Nice. Yeah, boy. Malcolm X. Oh, yeah. Growing up, I know. I mean, I looked at Malcolm X like we all do as an icon. I never thought that I would be accepted and embraced by his family and become literally part of that family. And I say that humbly because my whole life has just been, you know, a surprise to me, man. Yeah, I paint, I speak, I do poetry. I embrace all the arts. I just ain't going to. Uh, I just ain't going to do no b boy stuff because my knees are. Kind of <laughs> uh, down in Sonora, where the pot grows tall, where rattlesnakes crawl, where vultures fly the sky and rattlesnakes crawl, it was in this hot, dry desert waste where I first came face to face. With Rosita Esposito, known as the Mexicali. That's enough. Ah! <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> so, can you take us back to your early photography? What was it uh, about graffiti that uh, drew you in? Was it the walls? Was it the trains? What was your earliest uh, uh, photos of? Well, I'm going to upset a lot of people, and uh, I give zero, you know what? So <laughs> I used to work, man. I had to go to work. And you'd be on a train with 100 stinky people that are going to work, coming from work, tired. And they had to get off at certain stops. And there's like 100 stops. And because of them jive-ass graffiti cats, you couldn't see out the window to see what stop you were at. And back then, the sound system's telling you what to do. <laughs> so you're like, oh, damn. And... You know, Henry Chalfon and all them people, uh, Charlie Ahern and, you know, uh, you know, they all do these books and these movies on how beautiful graffiti was. But that's because they never had to ride the trains and had to be an hour late because they got off at the wrong stop or, you know, they passed their stop because you couldn't see out the window. And, and 
unlike them, I believe that 80% of graffiti was garbage, garbage. And I photographed the garbage so that later, if anybody argued with me, I got the receipts. There was some incredibly beautiful stuff. There's a cat named Vulcan. Whoa. If he was right, they'd have an airport named after him. Uh, there were just so many incredible graffiti artists, man. And uh, But there were a lot of cats that just fucked up the trains, fucked up the neighborhood, fucked up the side of your house. You know, just so, yeah, I love graffiti to this day. Everywhere I go in the world, first thing I ask, when I went to Brazil, first thing I said to the cab driver, graffiti. He couldn't speak English. He took me to graffiti. He picked me up four hours later, and I hadn't even photographed half of it. There's areas, and in Brazil, they got a funny thing. The police won't bother you because there's certain areas you can do it. If you do it in other areas, they break your hands. Also, uh, a lot of the graffiti is 10, 15 years old because there's a rule. You don't tag over somebody else's stuff, and, mm. and you're not going to get a beating. You're going to get worse. So, you know, it's... <laughs> Each civilization has its own rules and codes of conduct. Right. Uh, I could tell you some stories about me in Brazil uh, going into the favela with a $3,000 camera and nothing but a grin and didn't realize I was stuck. And I was like, okay, this is like a Stephen King novel. But what happened, it was a particularly hot day. And I took off my shirt and I let my hair down and my hair goes all the way down my back. I let my hair down and I used my shirt to cover my camera. I just walked through and they, the brothers were all, you know, yo, what's up? You know, and I was like, but that was a close one, man. And them cats don't carry nines and uh, 45s. They carry anti-tank weapons. I mean, they, they carry some stuff on the next level. They're ready to go to war against Iraq. I mean, they're, they're, they're so 